Surah Al-Mubarakah Al-Fatiha. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما شاء الله لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الصادقين الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على وسيل رسول رب العالمين عبدك ووليك وأخي رسولك وحجتك على خلقك وآيتك الكبرى والنباء الأظيم أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي لا يحتك هجابه ولا يغلق بابه ولا يرد سائله ولا يخيب آمله أما بعد فيقول الله في كتاب الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم فاست ولاود السلوات عنا عبد أهل البيت سلوات الله وسلام عليهم The second in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Muhammad Al-Mahdi Ajjalallah Farajahu Sharif. Brothers, sisters, respected elders, scholars, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The question of, retain, of maintaining religiosity outside of Muharram is a question that's asked by many a child and many an adult and many an elder. That when it reaches the end of 10 days, many people begin to ask this question. That within those 10 days, there was something there that contributed to us being religious within those 10 days. And therefore you find that when you go outside of these 10 days, people begin to do what they used to do before. That the reality is that in the months of Muharram, or not even the month of Muharram, I would say the first 10 or 15 days, everyone's religious. Likewise, within Ramadan, everyone's religious. But the problem is that because of this sectional or choosing religiosity within the human being, he finds that he's not successful within his religion. And therefore, within this Muharram, we find that many children and many adults say to their brothers or their friends, brother, let's go downtown and pump the noha to the full volume. Pump the noha so, so loud that the whole street know that the Shia of Ali Muhammad are here. But the reality is outside of Muharram, he's saying, brother, pump the music so loud that they know that the brothers of Canada, the brothers of Montreal are sitting in the streets of Montreal. And therefore the reality is, brothers and sisters, that this needs to be examined. That this ideology or this thought or this concept is a very negative concept within our communities. And within, uh, within our communities is affecting our children. Because you, d you find from the elders to the adults to the children, each level has the same problem. And another problem is that why does this happen? This happens because we follow who? The Ahlul Bayt? No. We follow celebrities. We follow music stars. MashaAllah, the music stars. We follow the sports stars. We follow that these individuals, we keep following them. And we disregard everything else. Now, within this Western community, what do you call these individuals, celebrities and sports? What do you call these sports individuals? What do you call them? You call them stars. And those of you who are accustomed to martial arts will know an individual called Bruce Lee. Now, you're, you're probably thinking, why is this guy mentioning Bruce Lee at the mosque? I'll tell you why. He says... When in an interview, does he, do you know what he says? He says in an interview, someone says to him that you're a star. Do you know what he replies? He goes, I am not a star. A star is an illusion that cannot be real. I am reality. 
When I do my stunts or whatever I do on TV, that is a real thing. Therefore, don't call me a star. And therefore, we need to realize that in this month of Muharram, we need to leave these so-called stars behind. And we need to follow such examples as the Ahl al-Bayt. What did I say in previous lectures? What did I say? The implications of being a follower of the Ahl al-Bayt are three. Obedience, becoming a representative, and hurting. The problem is when you, don't, when you are not obedient, therefore you are not a representative. If you are not a representative and you claim to be a lover of the Ahl al-Bayt, what does it mean? It means you are hurting the Ahl al-Bayt. If you are hurting the Ahl al-Bayt, the reality is that you are hurting yourself. Because on the day of Qiyamah, when they ask you, you love the Ahl al-Bayt, what were you doing? You won't even be able to remember their name, like I mentioned yesterday. Therefore, what the verses that I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture was what? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Why? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, then ar-Rahman ar-Rahim again. Showing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala straight away in the beginning of the Quran, saying that I am merciful. I am merciful. He emphasized it twice. Not once, twice. In the beginning, not at the end, at the beginning of the Quran. This shows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rahman. Where do we see? That he is Rahman. You look at many verses in the Quran. But let's look at an example. We looked at Hur, didn't we in previous nights? Hur. The pinnacle of reaching Rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? He is the quintessence of Rahmah upon earth. Quintessence means the most excellent example within this world. Why? Hur, at the beginning of this month of Muharram, he was going towards hell. By the 10th day we find that he's revered between all the communities, whether they're Sunni or whether they're Shia, everyone reveres Hur. And therefore, in this lecture, we seek to examine a number of areas to understand how to maintain and how not to maintain. Because the reality is that when you say maintaining, then obviously you're doing something wrong that you can't maintain it outside of Muharram. Therefore, in the first level, we want to look at psychological reasons and psychological factors. For example, when you come in Muharram, collectiveness. You prepare months before for Muharram. The effect of your friends, the effect of peer pressure, and the effect of some people are followers and some people are leaders. On the second level, we want to look at the news. The news. And when you watch the news, they contribute to this illusion of sin. On the third level, what is the third level? The third level, brothers and sisters, is the question of I'm not ready yet. Hijab, I'm not ready yet. Prayer, I'm not ready yet. Fasting, I'm not ready yet. Spirituality, I'm not ready yet. Marriage, I'm not ready yet. Let's look at why you're not ready. On the fourth level, infallibility of the Imams. That can we really follow these individuals that are infallible? Can we? We'll find out if we can and will we. On the fifth level, the, on the fifth level how to beat this illusion of sin. That there are tools within us that we can use to defeat sin. But what are these tools? What is the role of shaitan? What is the role of shaitan making us sin? Or does he make us sin? These are questions that need to be answered. And on the sixth level, what is the role of fasting and prayer in combating the illusion of sin? On the seventh level, modernism versus traditionalism. Hind versus Fatima is Zahra. And on the final level, the eighth level, what we're going to look at, we're going to look at is the Islam a re, is Islam a religion that is like the sea? Are we the fish within the sea, or are we like a crab? That when we feel like going in the sea, we go in the sea. When we don't, we go out of the sea. Each one of this we're going to look at with the salawat. We find in Muharram, when individuals come to the mosque, they have the same goal. What is the goal? To cry for Abu Abdullah, to do matam of Abu Abdullah, to become the azadar of Abu Abdullah. And when we have the same goal, brothers and sisters, we work collectively. When you work collectively in anything, you become successful. Now they say within the English language, if we are collected and we are combined, we can do anything. But divided, we fall. Divided, we fall. And therefore you need to understand that when you're collectively praying namaz, there's more thawab than farada. Collectively praying namaz, more thawab. Therefore getting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala collectively is much easier. That there's a certain motivation within 
Muharram. That you find two, three months before people will say, Brother, do you know? Two, three months. December's coming, November's coming. Do you know, what, do you know what's in November and December? Muharram. Brother, let's start preparing. Let's stop listening to our music so that when Muharram comes, we stop listening to our music. That this music is a devil within us, but within Muharram and Ramadan, look how the human being fights it off. He says, for Abba Abdullah, I'm willing to sacrifice everything that I do. And therefore, on another level, you prepare in advance. But what is another important factor to this? Habit. From a young age, from the young age of one and two, or you are told about the message of Abba Abdullah. You know that within the months of Muharram, within the nights of Ramadan, I have to be religious because it's a habit. Prayer is a habit sometimes. Fasting is a habit sometimes. This is negative and this is positive. At least that we do it. And therefore we need to realize that this habit, how do we use it? We need to use it properly in these 10 days so that this habit becomes a 365 day thing, a yearly thing. That in our whole lives we can apply this habit. Friends, how important are friends brothers and sisters? Those of you who have friends in university circles would know Either these friends, I know I keep mentioning such examples, but university tells you that these examples exist and you need to learn about the realities of life. That your children are going through universities and colleges where they're facing this problem every single day. And if you are neglecting this problem, then you're to blame. I'm not the one who's going to be to blame on the Day of Judgment. My job is not to tell you what to think. My job is to tell you how to think. And therefore, your friends can either take you to the pubs, either can, they can push you towards the nightclubs and the music world, or these friends can take you towards religion. Abba Abdullah, look at his friends, Habib ibn Muzahir. We're going to talk about this individual later. But your friends can take you either to heaven, or your friends can take you either to hell. And Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salam, narrates. He narrates that do not blame people if they accuse you of something when your friends are doing that thing. For example, your friends are all alcoholics or they all listen to music or they're all drug addicts. Who do you think you're going to be called? Are you going to be called a namazi? You're going to be called the one who upholds prayer? Look at your circle of friends, brothers and sisters. The problem in today's society is that friends, I don't want to upset my friend. You're upsetting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't want to upset the people, but you're upsetting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me give you a story. The scholars narrate that there are two individuals, a child and his father. Pay attention to this story. A child and his father. There's a donkey. They're walking through the village. They're walking through the village. At first, they're not using the donkey. Do you know what people say to them? Look at these idiots. They don't even use the donkey. They've got a donkey and they don't use it. So the father sits on the donkey. They're carrying on through the village. What an oppressive father he is. He's making his child walk. So the child sits on the donkey. Look at that child. How rude he is. He's making his father walk. So they both sit on the donkey. They both sit on the donkey and the people, you know what the people say? Look how oppressive both of them is. The donkey is so small and look how much they weigh. What's the moral of this story? People will never be happy with you. You can say what you want, you can do what you want. When it comes down to the crunch, the people are going to say, listen, I don't like this, 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 and that about you. And therefore, you need to understand that friends are very important. And therefore, friends contribute to what? Contribute to peer pressure. Yes, peer pressure, brothers and sisters. Those of you who are in the smoking world, yes, after Majlis, I see many of you, Masha. To one after the other, one after the other. Those of you who are in the smoking world will know that peer pressure can be of two types, positive and negative. You come to the mosque, everyone's praying, peer pressure. I have to pray because everyone's praying, they're going to say, why are you not praying? You exempt from prayer? You some kind of imam or something? You infallible that you're not allowed to, you, you're not allowed to pray? Even the imams pray, but you know, what can you do? But the reality is that peer pressure can be of two types. Positive, that everyone's fasting, you fast. Everyone's praying, you pray. Positive, that's positive. Negative, outside everyone's smoking. Child goes, say, uncle, can I have a, can I have a cigarette? 
Uncle goes, Bismillah. Negative. Negative aspect of peer pressure. And therefore, the final aspect of this soul discussion is what? This one aspect has told us a number of things. What's the final part of this aspect? Followers and leaders. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He's a leader. That's why 72 people followed him. Did these out of 72 become the leaders? No, they became followers. Therefore you realize in the Western world that many of us are followers. How? For example, those of you who are acquainted with the music world will know of such artists as Jay Sean, Rihanna, Eminem, Madonna. Only my research I've come across this, man. That each one of these, you follow them. Let me mention something for the adults. In the Bollywood world, Rahat Fateh Ali Khan. Yes, uh, uncles, you probably love him, eh? And Adnan Sami. Yes, you all know him, don't you, uncles? Yes. And the reality is that we follow these individuals. That when we follow these individuals, these are like our idols. For example, within the Western world, you've probably heard of something called American Idol. Pop Idol. Idols. That you follow them blindly. This is the illusion that the news tries to portray to you. That once, within the news, there was someone, I'm not going to mention her name from the prophet because her mother and father probably sent me an email, but her initials are A and W. Those of you who know, know. That she recently died because of drug, drugs and alcohol. And the reality is, brothers and sisters, that when people were dying in Bahrain, when people were dying in Syria, when people were dying in Pakistan, the news didn't even look at them. When people were complaining that you don't show this and you only show these celebrities, millions of people are dying and because she sang a few songs, she's some kind of superstar within this world. And the reality is, brothers and sisters, that we follow these individuals blindly. And each one of you who has access to internet, go to Google top documentary films dot com slash star suckers. Watch how the American people just sign their children away to media. Sign them away. That they don't even look at them. And because of this illusion, brothers and sisters, we fall into a trap. When we fall into this trap, then no one knows. We watch the television. Yes, watch the television. But watch something productive. Watch something on the animals. Watch something productive. Don't waste your life. Because the, you can't waste time. Like I said the other day, you can't waste time. You waste your life. And therefore, when you go into this illusion, brothers and sisters, when you form a conclusion within this illusion, you begin to say such things as, I'm not ready yet. Hajab, I am not ready yet. Surah Nur, verse 30, 31, I am not ready yet. Says Hajab, says male Hajab, female Hajab, I am not ready yet. You say to him, Hajj, I am not ready yet. Should I tell you something beautiful about Hajj? Recently, I went on Hajj this year, brothers and sisters. I went with this individual. I'm not going to mention his name, he knows who he is, and he's probably listening to this lecture right now. He before he went to Hajj, he listened to music. Before he went to Hajj, he did not pray. Before he went to Hajj, he did not fast. Before he went to Hajj, he was acquainted with all the negatives of the Western world. He says, when I came back from Hajj, and this is Hajj, brothers and sisters, this is Hajj. Hajj is a revolution within yourself when you go. Don't say, I'm not ready to go Ziyara. I'm not ready to go Hajj. If you're not ready, go to Hajj and watch Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reform each and every one of you. And if it doesn't reform you, then call me a liar. Call me a liar. That Hajj is such a journey. If you understood what it was, it would reform each one of you. Therefore, don't say I'm not ready. Because within yourself, as Amir al muminin narrates, within yourself you can hold the whole universe within yourself. Don't say you're not ready. You are ready. Each one of you whether you're young or whether you're old, you're ready to become religious. The question is, how much are you willing to struggle? That is the big question, brothers and sisters. How much are you willing to, 
to struggle. And you need to reflect that there's many people in society, they'll go to the gym and they'll make the big muscles. That if you tell them, you pick up a truck, he'll pick it up with one hand and throw it to the side. You bring a female in front of him. You know what he does? Watch this. Watch what I'm doing here. Yeah? Female's coming in from this side. MashaAllah. SubhanAllah. Alhamdulillah. And by the end, inshallah. One day, inshallah. This is the reality. That is something funny. True. It is funny. But you need to understand that this is the reality today. That each one of us, like I said in previous lectures, materialism, materialism, materialism. Body, 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 body. But what about inside? Inside, fix, your, fix yourself inside. Spirituality is not just physical. It is, spirituality is made out of physical and metaphysical. This is spirituality. That if you think you're going to weigh 20 stones and pray namaz all the time and you think you're religious, that's not going to happen. But if you think that you're going to have the biggest muscle in the world and you're going to become religious, that's not going to happen. You need to strike a balance. A balance needs to be there within the human being. And if a balance is not there, brothers and sisters, you will never, ever be able to be religious. So strike that balance. Find that balance within yourself. Go to the Hajj. Go visit the Imams. Go visit the Bibian. Bibi Zainab, go visit her in Syria and Egypt. Visit them. If you don't visit them, how will you know what they are and what their positions are? That you could make that one visit and you could revolutionize your whole self, but also come back and revolutionize your whole community. Revolutionize your whole community. And therefore we need to look at the Imam. Because so many people today, the intellectuals of our, our society say, you cannot follow the Imam. I said to him, what do you mean you can't follow the Imam? What are you saying? Didn't the Prophet come down so that we can follow him? Yeah, but he's infallible. He's what? He's infallible. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Salwar. That the Imams are infallible. And them being infallible means that we can't follow these individuals. You've made a mess of the whole conception of Shiism here. You've made a whole mess of the whole thing. Infallibility means that the individual can sin, but he wouldn't. Can wouldn't two different things for example if i ask one of the brothers here can you take your clothes off and go outside and run in the streets naked the brother's going to say yes i can would you no why wouldn't you do it because it's disrespectful that women and men will see me and see things that they really shouldn't be seen and this is the reality that we don't understand the imams for who they are that we think they're imams let's not talk about them for example, there's a story by Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib. Someone comes to the Imam. This is after the battle of Jamal and after the battles of Safin. Someone comes to the Imam. She says, May Allah's curse, na'udhu billah min dhalik, may Allah's curse be on Amir al muminin This is what the woman says. What the woman says? Curse. You know what Amir al muminin says? How can I help you? Why, what has the caliph done wrong to you? Because she doesn't know this is Amir al-Mu'mineen. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, what has the caliph done to you? She goes that the caliph has taken both of my sons. That he took them to war and he got them killed. So Amir al-Mu'mineen said, shall I bake the dough for you? Shall I get the water and the flour and help you? And they say weeks later, her daughter saw Amir al-Mu'mineen and she said, do you know mother who this is? This is the caliph. And Amir al-Mu'mineen, instead of being arrogant, you know like we would. Someone comes and says, Latin on us and we'd be like, what do you think you're doing? Eh? We slap him across the face. The reality is that our Imam, look how beautiful he gives the example. She comes back to him, she says, I'm sorry Imam. Instead of being arrogant, you know people sometimes, I've been helping you, I've been doing this for you, I've done this for you. I carried you here and look how you're... If you've done it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you shouldn't be saying anything. If you've done it for that person, then you're going to complain. If you've done it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why should you complain? You say, my rizq is with Allah. You do what you want. Amir al muminin says, you know what he says? These words, brothers and sisters, if you understood each one of these words of our Imam, 
I tell you, there'll be no one like the Shia on, our, on this earth. Imam says, forgive me if I have done anything wrong. And if I have done anything wrong, I ask you to ask Allah to forgive me. Listen, if there's not a Nara Hadri in this, then I don't know when you're going to say Nara Hadri. Honest to God. Therefore, we need to understand that we need to beat this illusion. How? Like I said in previous lectures, that the human being has four faculties within him. What are these four faculties? Anger. Yeah, tell me. Um, um, it was just, yeah, I think, two, yesterday, wasn't it? Two days ago. Fine. Anger, imagination, desire, and intellect. I told you before, let me give you another example of this. There's a hockey match going on. There's a hockey match going on. Within this hockey match, you have the devils and you have the angels. Now when the angels score a goal, the devils make a tactic to score another goal. And the scholars say that when you use such an example, you say that as long as it's 2-1 to the angels, 3-2 to the angels, Allah will forgive you for the mistakes that you made. And Allah will forgive you for those mistakes. But remember one thing. Don't let the devils beat you in that 90 minute game because those 90 minutes of your life represent one year. Each year represents a minute. 90 years of your life. If the devil kept defeating you and kept defeating you and kept defeating, do you think you're going to go paradise? Do you think it's that simple? I love Ali Muhammad and the contradiction comes. Eh? I do this and I do that. But Ali Muhammad, Ali Muhammad, I pray. Ali Muhammad, I say what? Cry for Imam? Alhamdulillah. Imam Hussein, the, our elders, especially in, you know, when I was young, I used to get told this all the time. Putter, be fikir nahi aap. Kyu? Imam Hussein, sab namazan par diya aap ke liye. When someone comes to you and says something like that, and those of you don't understand Urdu, they said that don't worry, Imam Hussein has prayed all your prayers. You don't worry about prayer. Pray Alhamdulillah. The reality is that you need to pray, you need to fast. If you don't, then what religion have we actually accepted within ourselves? Therefore, beat this illusion. Don't let the devils beat you, beat the devils. Whether that be one nail or two nail, or three, two, five, six million, doesn't matter. Beat the, beat the devils because you're the angel. Find that angel within yourself and beat that devil. Because when you beat that devil, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you for the rest of the sin. And this is the reality, brothers and sisters. So therefore, we need to stop blaming shaitan. You know, we always blame, shaitan made me do this, shaitan made me do this. You read the Quran? The Quran says the whispers of shaitan. Tell me, brothers and sisters, has shaitan ever come to you, got you by the hand and said, let's go into the nightclub. Let's go into the pub. Let's go with the females. Has he? Has he come out? From wherever he is, grabbed you by the hand and took you. He said to you, go. You said to him, okay, I'm going. That shaitan, and this is a hadith, narrate shaitan's going to say to you on the day of judgment, when you blame him, he's going to say, I told you to do it. Why did you listen to me? You had free will. Do what you want. If you wanted to jump, you could have jumped. But the reality is you listen to me. That's your problem, not my problem. Why should I take your sin upon my head? Is that realistic? No, it's not realistic. And therefore, what is the importance of fasting and prayer? Those of you who are acquainted with science will know fasting is very beneficial to you. How? Fasting slows down the metabolism. By slowing down the metabolism, the desires of the human being come to a halt. That those desires of lust and those other desires, you'll find that in Ramadan, people become religious because they fast a lot. When they fast, all their meta metabolism slows down. And when their metabolism slows down, they come towards prayer. And they come towards fasting. And they say, and you know you have that period in Muharram and Ramadan when everyone says, brother, I'm telling you, there's going to be a revolution in our communities. Revolution in our communities. And as soon as Muharram, Ramadan finished, bro, what happened to your revolution? Two months down the line, yeah? What happened to your revolution? Oh, bro, you know, I just got a bit lazy, I got a bit tired. And the revolution went, 
And this is the reality that we need to understand. That this revolution needs to happen now, but we have to carry it through. That the only one, brothers and sisters, that's going to lose out is you. And I tell you this every day, the only one that is going to lose out is you. Your mother, she'll spend those hours on the prayer mat and she'll go to heaven. Your father will spend those hours on the prayer mat and they'll go to heaven. And while you waste your life, you think you're going to live all your life? You think you're just going to live and live? Yesterday, one of my family members at the age of 21 passed away. University. She didn't even finish her university. You're telling me that you're going to live forever? Wake up and smell the roses, brothers and sisters. That's what you need to do. And therefore, we need to look at this aspect of Westernism. Modernism. What is modernism? What is traditionalism? Let's look at the examples of Hind and Fatima is Zahra salawatullahu salamu alayha. Now in looking at this example first we're going to look at hijab. Hind was very well known for not having good hijab. Now hijab brothers and sisters for those of you who don't know and I'm pretty sure all of you do know that hijab is of two aspects physical and social. Physically people have mashallah brilliant hijab as soon as you hit the Facebook my god Hijab goes down the drain. Social hijab. Now you tell me brothers and sisters, those of you who have access to Facebook, what does it mean to poke? Poke. What do you mean poke? Which one of you in real life pokes a female? What does it mean to poke? I'll leave that to your discretion. But the, the reality is that hijab needs to be maintained on the physical level. That's this part. And the social level, if you've got hijab around your head and you're wearing makeup that you look like a Barbie doll, do you need to ask yourself, is this hijab? Ask yourself. I can tell you there's a bullet coming. It's going to go straight through. I'm going to drop right here, I'm telling you. Anyway. And Hind, what did she do? She used to listen to music. That she used to have dancers in front of her and listen to music. Let me tell you what hijab is, brothers and sisters. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam, he narrates that one day I brought a blind man into the house of Fatima al Zahra. A what? A deaf man? No. A blind man. A blind man came into the house of Fatima al Zahra, and what happened? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, what does he say? He says, Fatima, why do you do hijab even in front of the blind man when he cannot see your hair? He cannot see, so why are you doing hijab? Do you know what she replies? Listen to this reply, brothers and sisters. This is a phenomenal reply. And only the Ahl al-Bayt can reply like this. He may not be able to see me, but I can see him. I can see him. Let's go further than this. My parents, in front of them, I do not sin. I can see my parents. But Allah sees you when you're in the middle of the night. And your parents are not there and you're sinning. Allah sees you. Ask yourself the question, what is Fatima al Zahra's thinking? I see him, but Allah sees me. When Allah sees me, how can I deceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That He gives me birth. From a young age, He feeds me. Do you think your mom and dad feed you? Your mom and dad are tawassal. To being fed. The real risk, where does it come from? It comes from the ground. Your parents work, and then you get fed. True? Your parents work, and then you get fed. Allah sees you all the time. Every single minute of your lives, Allah sees you. But the problem is, the problem is, brothers and sisters, we don't see Allah. And Amir al muminin narrates that I don't see Allah with these eyes, I see Allah with the eyes of the heart. Do we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the eyes of the heart? And therefore, brothers and sisters, fasting and prayer is the utmost importance. Within the Quran, it says at chapter 9, verse 45, 
Prayer keeps you away from sin. If it doesn't keep you away from sin, you have to ask yourself the question, am I praying properly? That when I'm going and I'm becoming like a Ferrari within my prayer, that one minute or one millisecond I'm finished, four rakat, to ask yourself, am I praying properly? Ask your mothers and ask your fathers how they used to pray on the masala, the hours and hours upon end. Us today, us modern people, no, modern people, we can't even spend five minutes in the masala for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The most peaceful time in your day is going to be on the masala when you're not running around and doing anything else, you're on the prayer mat and you're praying to your Lord. Because they say, and it says in the Quran as well, it says, that only in the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will the hearts find peace. The hearts find peace. Therefore you need to ask yourself, why are you not finding peace? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not become a part of your physical and your spiritual makeup. That you have not understood what Allah is. If you understood what Allah is, then you would have been ahead of everyone else in prayer. You would have been waking up for Salatul Layl and you would understand your Lord from every single aspect possible. And therefore, the final aspect of this talk is what? The religion is like an ocean. The religion is like an ocean. Do you know what we are? We are like that fish in the ocean that swerves from left and swerves to right. That goes to one knowledge of the ocean and goes to the other knowledge of the ocean. That goes from one part of the ocean to the other part of the ocean. And when the fish is removed from the ocean, it can't breathe. It begins to die. You should be like the fish within the ocean. That Islam should, that when you're within Islam, you go to his different knowledges. You go to one knowledge and then you go to the other knowledge and then you go to the other knowledge. And when someone says to you, come out of the religion of Islam, you say, if I come out of the religion, I'm going to die. I'm going to die but the problem is and there's too many problems within ourselves that we're like a crab we go in the ocean in the month of Muharram and Ramadan then we come back out carry on what we're doing and therefore one of the brothers said very beautifully that we are Shia in a season not for a reason season reason Season, Muharram Ramadan. What's your reason for being Shia? My mother and father told me. And therefore, brothers and sisters, you need to realize that we are in a religion of sacrifice. Without sacrificing, you will not get anywhere. If you don't sacrifice for the religion of Islam, you tell me, brother, you tell me honestly. Business, how many hours do you sacrifice? For your business to become successful, how many hours do you sacrifice? Hours upon hours, hours upon hours. You tell me, those individuals who are coming up in exam period, within Montreal and Canada, exam period is coming up, isn't it? It's coming up, isn't it? Ask yourself the question, don't prepare for your exams. You're going to be successful. Don't even look at your textbooks. Are you going to be successful? But the reality is when you go to your exam room, and you have a question mark written on your head and probably across it will also say stupid because you didn't revise who's to blame? you're going to blame Allah? you're going to blame shaitan? who are you going to blame? the only one to blame is yourself brothers and sisters this is the reality this is the reality that we do not think about so much focus, businesses, school what about, what about here? who's going to focus on this? inside not outside, who's going to struggle for this? For anything within the human being, he has to struggle for it. Struggle for paradise and watch how you get paradise in this world and the hereafter. That those people who sacrificed, do you know how they sacrificed? That those companions of Abba Abdullah who sacrificed for this religion, do you think it was something easy for them? Let me go through some of these companions so that you understand what sacrifices they made. There was a 90-year-old man. Brothers and sisters, there was a 90-year-old man. Do you know what his name was? John. There's two Johns. John the Christian and John the Abyssinian. John the Abyssinian was 90 years old. And they say, when he went towards Karbala, he had to tie his stomach because his back was bent due to his age. 
And when Aba Abdullah said to John, do you know what he said to John? He said to John, John, why are you sacrificing for us? You do, not, you do not need to sacrifice for us. You spend your whole life in obedience to the Ahl al-Bayt. Do you know how he replies? And only the companions of Aba Abdullah can reply like this. Do you know what he says? He says, Aba Abdullah, what face, what will I say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he asks me, why didn't you protect my Imam on earth? What face will I show Fatima to Zahra? What face will I show Fatima to Zahra when she asked me, why didn't you protect my son? And Abu Abdullah constantly to his companion said, go. He said to John, go again. Do you know what John replied? Only the companions, brothers and sisters, can reply like this. He says, Ya Abu Abdullah, I swear by Allah that when my head is removed from my body and the blood in the floor is gushed, and your blood is also gushed upon the same floor. My blood will be purified by your blood and I will be the purest of creation due to your blood. Only the companions of Abba Abdullah. You want to know about the sacrifices of this religion, brothers? I'll tell you about the sacrifices. Wahab al-Kalbi. 17 days. A hadith narrates. 17 days the individual is married. And he says, forget the world. On the day of Karbala, this individual, he left everything for Abba Abdullah, brothers and sisters. Everything. That they say, brothers and sisters, after being married for 17 days, every time he would go towards Karbala, his wife would say, don't go. Please, we've, been, we've just been married, it's only been 17 days. Please don't go towards Karbala. And eventually, she goes towards Abba Abdullah and says, do you promise that we have paradise together? Abba Abdullah says, yes, but still, she says, Wow, please don't leave me. I love you so much. It's only been 17 days. Those of you who have wives will know how much of a pain it is to leave your wives behind. 17 days, brothers and sisters. 17 days, and he went. He went towards Karbala, and his head was removed. And do you know what his mother said? Umar ibn Sa'ad, brothers and sisters, threw the head back to them. And when he threw the head back to them, brothers and sisters, do you know what happened? His mother grabbed the head and threw it back to Umar ibn Sa'ad. This is a mother, brothers and sisters. This is a mother. She goes, when I sacrifice for Fatima is Zahra, why should I want it back from you? Let me give you another example of a companion. Another example of the companion is when Abba Abdullah is praying his Salah. And the companions stand in front. They take those arrows on the chest. And brothers, a hadith narrate that there's a scholar. He, what he says, the scholar says, that brothers and sisters, the scholar says that I thought I could be amongst those companions. And I said to Abba Abdullah, show me that I would have been there as well. And he narrates that in a dream, I saw Abba Abdullah and he was praying and I stood in front of them. 30 years, they say, this scholar studied, 30 years. I stood in front of them. When the arrows came, I moved out of the way. And brothers and sisters, when they moved out of the way, he says that Abu Abdullah was struck by the arrow and he was killed there and then. Do you know the level and the sacrifice that these companions made? Brothers and sisters, there's another companion. Do you know what he says? He says, Ya Abu Abdullah, if you ask me to sacrifice my life a thousand times for you, that a thousand times my body was cut into pieces, and I was resurrected, I would do it all over again because I love you, Abba Abdullah, I love you. And brothers and sisters, let me come to the Masaib now. That wasn't the Masaib, the Masaib is just about to start. They say, brothers and sisters, there was a companion by Habib ibn Mubahir. What a phenomenal companion he was. They say this Habib, brothers and sisters, when Hussein ibn Ali used to walk on the streets, he used to get the dust of Abu Abdullah and rub it on his face and he said, I love Abu Abdullah. And Abu Abdullah said, I love you. And this is love, brothers. And when the lover says, I love you. He said, he grabs the dust and rubs it on his face. And they say, when this Habib ibn Mudahir came to Hussein ibn Ali, they hugged each other and they began to cry. And when they began to cry, brothers and sisters, when they began to cry, do you know what happened? Zainab says, who is that crying outside? How mazloom is the Ahlul Bayt? She says, give my salam, assalamu alayka ya Habib ibn Mudahir. Habib ibn Mudahir gets his 
gets his turban, he throws it on the floor and he says, Woe upon me, woe upon me, that the daughters of Fatima the Zahra have come and they are saying salam upon me, what day has befallen the Ahlul Bayt? This is Habib ibn Mudahir. And they say that Zainab walked. She walked in the tents and she went past the tent of Banu Hashim. And Banu Hashim, this is the reality, Banu Hashim said, Do not let the companions die before you. Because if the companions die before you, people will say they were cowards and they put the companions before the Banu Hashim. And she says that I went to the camp of Habib ibn Mudahid. And do you know what Habib ibn Mudahid said, brothers and sisters? He said, do not let the Banu Hashim die before us. Because if they die before us, then they will say that the companions are cowards. And if the companions are cowards, brothers and sisters, how can you say the companions are cowards? That they say that we are the slaves of Banu Hashim. We are the slaves of Banu Hashim. And they say, Shimmer, may Allah curse him. Shimmer, do you know what he says? He says, why do you, the 72 companions, pray so much? You're going to hell anyway, why do you pray? They say Habib ibn Mudair became angry. And when Habib became angry, he said, Ya Aba Abdullah, let me go towards Karbala. Let me go towards the enemy. He said to Aba Abdullah, Assalamu alayka Ya Aba Abdullah. Allow me to go towards the battlefield. They say Habib went towards the battlefield. When he went towards the battlefield, brothers and sisters, when Habib went towards the battlefield, when he went towards the battlefield, they say he killed 62 of the enemy. When he killed 62, brothers and sisters, the thirst, the thirst came upon him. They seen that Muslim Ibn Aqil was affected by the thirst. Then the Ahlul Bayt were affected by the thirst. And then Habib Ibn Mudahir was affected by the thirst. And they say Umar Ibn Sa'ad said, surround him. And they say they threw stones at him and threw swords upon him. Eventually, they say the sword struck him and he called out, Ya Hussein, help me! Ya Hussein, help me! He said, Assalamu alaikum, Ya Hussein, I am going towards my death. They said, Hussein ibn Ali ran out. They, he ran out, and do you know what happened when he ran out, brothers and sisters? They, he ran out, and do you know what he said? He said, Habib ibn Mudahir, put your head upon my lap. And the poets narrate. How beautifully they narrate, brothers and sisters, they say. Habib ibn Mudahir is putting, your, putting his head on your lap today. But Ya Hussein, you know where I'm going, brothers and sisters. Ya Hussein, whose lap will you put your head upon? Will it be the lap of Shimmer Mal'oon? Who will come upon your chest and rip your body and rip your head from its sockets? And therefore, brothers and sisters, when this happened, they say, Sakina, when she heard this and she saw her father, she began to cry. And when she began to cry, she said, Hussein, he, he said, Ya Abba Abdullah, I have lost you, my father. I have lost you, Ya Abbas, that your hands have been severed. Akbar, your chest was struck by the spear. Aliun Askar, your neck was pierced by the arrow. And this is the Muslim Karbala, brothers and sisters. Therefore, we need to learn because the Ahl al-Bayt, as I said at the beginning of this lecture, are the Mazloom. So why do you torment the Ahl al-Bayt with your sins? Because this is the end of the spirituality of my lectures. And I want to finish with a parting thought. That how can you make and believe that you are Shia of the Ahl al-Bayt? They were Mazloom in Karbala. And you make them even more Mazloom by being the Shia going against them. And therefore, brothers and sisters, raise your hands in dua. Raise your hands and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us the pure Shia of the Ahlul Bayt. To understand that this Western world has its positive and has its negative, then may Allah keep us away from the negatives of the Western world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to pray and fast and do our fru and understand our roots of our religion. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise us with the imam of our time and not make the imam of our time cry. And therefore, like, as per normal of my lectures, please raise your hands. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim.
اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل الساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعين حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين